Welcome back to part two of RS422 differential signaling, the details. And in this part, I want at least cover point to multipoint connections. That is one transmitter sending data to several transceivers, also called multi-drop sometimes. And I already have here another length of 10 meters of Cat3 twisted pair cable ready for demonstration purposes. Maybe I've managed to uh, fit in at the end all the stuff that's important about the RS422 ground connection. We'll see. Anyway, enjoy. So, first up, RS422 simplex multidrop. Multidrop meaning that one transmitter, line driver, can drive the line for or transmit to maximum of 10 receivers connected to that RS422 line. Uh, the line is of course terminated. The electrical specification for RS422 transmitter line drivers and receivers ensures that this is actually working. So there's a minimum driving power and there's a minimum input, yeah, impedance resistance here for the receivers. I talked about that in detail in part one of the basics card here, link in the description. Simplex simply means information is only flowing in one direction. So from the direct transmitter to the receivers. I spliced in here that additional length of 10 meters Cat3 twisted pair cable, basically extending what I already had here on the bench. So a transmitter here on the left breadboard and sending its signal through a length of 20 meter twisted pair cable back there to a receiver here on the right breadboard and then the new cable comes into play and extends that signal line back to the left breadboard where it goes into a second receiver. To make things a wee bit clearer, like in the first part of the details card here, link in the description, my function generator is feeding via coax cable a 10 MHz signal to the breadboard terminated with 50 ohms here that goes into the transmitter half of my first ISL8490 RS422 transceiver. The signal goes via the RS422 line, 20 meters of Cat3 twisted pair cable to my right breadboard, where it is received by the receiver half of another ISL8490, and then loops back via the additional 10 meters of Cat3 twisted pair cable to the left breadboard again, where it is received by the receiver half of my first ISL8490. And of course, at the end of the transmission line, I have a 100 ohm termination. I talked about that in depth in part one of the details. And that's how it looks on the oscilloscope. We have the input signal here from the function generator. That's the output signal of my right hand side receiver and that's the output signal of my left hand side receiver. So output after 20 meters, output after 30 meters of twisted pair cable. And to show you the timing relation between the signals, let's just signal capture that when I switch on my function generator. Yeah. Here we go. So that first high here from the function generator corresponds to that high here on my right hand side output and that high here of my left hand side output. So the timing difference between this and this high here, this is just the delay through 10 meters of twisted pair cable. And please ignore the over and undershoots and the ringing here on the digital signals. That's just uh, breadboard artifacts. Now we've seen what's going in here and what's coming out here and here. And please remember we had a 50 nanosecond delay here between the two outputs just caused by the 10 meters of Cat3 twisted pair cable. 
question is, how does the signal look like here on our differential lines for the first receiver and here for the second receiver? Let's have a look. I rearranged my probes to show the differential RS422 signal here at the right hand side receiver and here on the left hand side receiver. On the oscilloscope, the top two traces are the differential RS422 pair as measured on the right hand side receiver and the lower two traces are the differential pair as measured on the left hand side receiver. As we learned in part one, <laughs> frequency does matter when it comes to termination and reflections. So let's just sweep down from 10 megahertz quickly to 5 megahertz, 8 megahertz. Yeah, well, might be some reflection stuff here, but not too bad. And we are at. 5 megahertz. Yeah, doesn't look too shabby for 30 meters twin <laughs> twisted pair cable, does it? At 10 megahertz, no less. Um, but again, uh, let's single capture with the function generator off to show the timing relations. And fire on the hole. So you see again here between these high low and that high low about 50 nanoseconds delay. That's really 10 meters of twisted pair cable. But what happens if we change the topology a wee bit? Huh? As threatened, I mixed things up quite a bit. So our transmitter here on the left side is now transmitting into the 20 meter cable and the 10 meter cable. The 20 meter cable still goes behind the oscilloscope somewhere into our right hand side receiver, receiver one. And the 10 meter cable is looping back into our left hand breadboard into the receiver 2. So the topology looks now something like this. From our transmitter we have 20 meters of cut 3 cable going to our right hand side first receiver where I terminated the line with a 100 ohm resistor and directly from the transmitter 2 we have 10 meters of another cat 3 twisted pair cable going to our left hand side second receiver. Now let's have a look at the oscilloscope. Again top two traces differential signal at the right hand side receiver, lower two traces differential signal on our left hand side transceiver. And you can see off the bat that the signal level on our left hand side transceiver seems to be a bit higher. Now let's sweep through the frequencies. So we are at 10 megahertz and going down, 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 9 megahertz. Oh, 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 look at that, look at that. 8 megahertz and yeah, reflections. It even uh, is visible here a little bit, but yeah, on the left hand side, yeah, the short 10 meter stop, it's, it's awful. But that should normalize if I go down to 5 megahertz. Yeah, kinda. I mean, uh, seriously, this looks wrong, doesn't it? This looks very, 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 very wrong. Let's go back to 10 megahertz, huh? Uh, okay, timing. Uh, function generator off. Single shot, function generator on. And you see that the signal at our left hand side through 10 meters, <laughs> again, is a little bit faster here, just 10 meters of twisted pair cable. Again, the 50 nanosecond lag aboutish. Then it arrives at our right hand side receiver through 20 meters of twisted pair. Yeah, 10 meters twisted pair, 50 nanoseconds delay. Hmm. 
but we can alleviate that problem by introducing a second termination resistor in our system here at the end of the transmission line on the left hand side breadboard. So obviously the reflections coming back from here through the 10 meters of twisted pair cable into our system and the other transmission line completely messed up the signal not only for this receiver but also for that receiver. So yeah and here is a new 100 ohm termination resistor at the end of this length of cable. Let's see on the oscilloscope what it can do for us. Once again, top traces differential signal, right side receiver, bottom traces differential signal, left hand side receiver. And right off the bat we see that the signal levels on our left hand side receiver are now smaller, about just the same as they are on our right hand side receiver. But now let's sweep through the frequencies, 10 megahertz going down down, 9 megahertz, down, 8 megahertz, a wee bit, a bit reflection, but nothing to write home about, 7 megahertz, it looks nice, 6 megahertz, still looking nice, 5 megahertz, perfect. So yeah, problem solved through a second termination resistor. So what we've done here is a multi-point termination. I mentioned that at the very end of part one of the details. I didn't go into the details back then, but basically you need multi-point termination if the, you have several receivers and the stops of these receivers get long. Then you are really forced to put termination resistors here at the inputs of every single receiver, depending on the stop length. If the stop is only very, very short, you don't really need that. But uh, yeah, as you can, <laughs> as you saw, at 10 meters stop length, uh, that totally messed up the whole transmission line. Okay, let's move on. Okay, let's take a break just here because I already filmed the next part and it's a little bit too long to put it together with the stuff we already talked about. So uh, yeah, sorry. Next time we'll talk about the importance of the C line or ground line, also called a signal return line and grounding issues in general in conjunction with RS422, which will be a wee bit longer because we also have a look at the inner workings of an RS422 transmitter line driver and receiver. Till then, bye.